And then, yeah, and then you've got the colorists after that. It dries and you've got the colorists. So it's actually a nice little, it's, it's fun to explain it that way so they understand what's going on. I think they'll enjoy that. You yeah. Know, just yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Volunteers, every hand goes up. as means you ask for a few volunteers. Yeah, yeah. Every. So you have a lot of volunteers that can help you there. Um, and I think it's fun for the girls to know that the colorists were all women because they did a really good job coloring things in with their fine look. Yeah. So where a so lot of things are done by men, most of these composers <laughs> and artists are going to be men. There are a few women, but most of them are men. Having the girls feel like, hey, we were the yeah. ones, we were always the colors. <laughs> so. Uh, so the lines were black and mm -hmm. then... And then they would add the color on top. Oh. Yeah. Um, so, let's see. So, oh, so the interesting thing, how lithography became um, important is that in about, in 18... Let's see, it was 19, 1795 is when lithography was developed in Bavaria, but it became popular in the United States in 1820. And Courier, Nathaniel Courier, was an apprentice to, it was W and S. Pendleton. They were the ones that, the first lithographers in the United States. They had a lithography company. And Nathaniel Courier was an apprentice there when he was 15. By the time, that was in... 1824 by 1835 so he was 26 years old he had already tried to start business a few times but this was when it really took off he started a lithography business he understood lithography and he started doing it and he got artists to help him do the drawings on the on the stones and he was the first one that was able to produce pictures for newspapers so up until that point you'd get news stories and there would be no pictures and so it was a big deal. There was a big um, financial market, like a big fire that happened in the financial district in New York. Mm -hmm. And the New York Sun had this big um, article on it. And he had an artist go draw it, produce a lithograph print, and put it in the newspaper. And it was huge. And within three days, people could see all the information and pictures. Now everything's instant. You pull it up on your phone. Like, you know exactly what happened the minute it happens. But back then, it would take weeks. People would not know. And, and you have it written down, but until you see a picture, you don't know really what happened. So lithography was huge for them then. And so this started, their, their company started in 1835. But by the time, so you can explain about that but by the time then you get your timeline out and they'll see okay so in 1885 i think it was 1885 or 1895 let me see when um their business went kaput and the whole reason behind that let's see and you'll look and you'll see the development of the camera and once the camera was popular and it was cheap to produce photographs then lithographs were obsolete so um, the, the company lasted about 65 years, um, so it must have been 19, 1895 is when things got really cheaply produced um, photographs. Um, and so that's, that's when the kids, or that's when you can show them on the timeline if you want. The timeline is very important, so whether you use it or not, you have to decide. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'll watch the recording. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank for you again so much. Yeah. I, I promise that the video hopefully will be short. <laughs> this long, I'm not sure. Um, um, probably about, I'll, I have about 10 more minutes. Okay. Thank you again. Thanks. Um, and so then the business, so Courier was doing all the lithography and his business started expanding and he realized he needed help. So his brother, Charles, said, hey, um, this James Ives, yeah. he can help us out. He's a bookkeeper. Turned out James Ives was actually a really good artist, too. So Ives came in and started helping, and the company grew and grew. Now, you'll see pictures of the two of them. Courier is this tall, elegant guy. Ives is this short, kind of stocky, dumpy guy. Um, but they were they worked really well together, and they. Uh, in that picture, the one who's shining front is Ives, and the one who's oh, yeah. is. So you'll see. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I thought it was the other way around. Yeah, this is Ives here. This is Curry. Oh, okay. So you can't see how tall they were. Mm -hmm. Oh. It, you can't. It, there's no way to show it. Yeah. And this is the only one where we talk about two people okay. as the artists, and they aren't even artists. Like 
Ives technically was an artist, and he did occasionally draw on the stones, but typically not. Um, and he actually, um, they don't know who actually drew this the village blacksmith. They don't have um, documentation for who actually produced this. The guess is that they had this woman named Mrs. Palmer that did a lot of their pastoral scenes. So the foliage, all these trees and the leaves, this woman did a lot of that for them. So when they would have prints that would have that kind of, she would do it. So they, they think it was her. She could have done the whole thing, or she did the trees and somebody came in and did the blacksmith. Mm -hmm. So they're not sure. Um, it's not documented anywhere. Um, let's see. And then um, Ives was the general manager. He helped manage um, the operations. Um, so the transition from talking about this to talking about the music, what they suggested is that... Um, so the company went out of business in 1880, 1885, in that time frame, um, because of the invention of the camera. And um, it talks about um, the, the different things in the blacksmith tableau. So that's where the kids would do all of the, um, the different parts of that. And then, um, the then you talk about the name of it. So the name of the music is the Anvil Chorus. Um, and so then you go into, so the different percussion instruments and the different things in the blacksmith, there's an anvil in the blacksmith shop. Well, the music is called the anvil chorus. You can go into as much detail as you want about the anvil chorus. Last year we talked about opera. There is no time to talk about it in this. It's an opera, but we talked about opera in depth and there's a big, um, I actually have the opera, um, a visual. I'll put it in there if you want to talk about opera, but it's way, it's so much information. There's so much to cover. So you can talk briefly about it, but the Anvil Chorus is part of an opera. Now, the opera it's part of, Il Travatore, the, the troubadour, is the most complicated opera I've ever seen. It's so, the story behind it is so, so incredible. Like, it's, it's not believable. It's so convoluted. And so basically what it boils down to, it's about these gypsies and this gypsy that throws the wrong baby into a fire. So you can decide whether you want to use that with the little kids or not. Throws the wrong baby into a fire and then the person that was supposed to be thrown into the fire ends up getting killed by his brother. It's the most bizarre story. And, and so you, you can go into, there's really, I mean, you'd have to look it up and read it. I know the whole story, but even I can't summarize it very well. It's bizarre. But what it boils down to, the Anvil Chorus is basically all these gypsies are getting up in the morning. And they're all, they're all sleeping around this fire. And they get up in the morning and they start hitting their anvils and start doing their blacksmith work and making their wagon wheels and their, and their horseshoes. And that's just, that's all it is. It's the beginning of a day for them. So you can explain as much as you want about the opera. It's, if you want, the kids really got into opera last year that I taught. So you can explain a little bit about the gypsies. We did actually have gypsies in opera. We did Carmen before, so we talked about gypsies. So they should, some of the kids will know about gypsies and what they are. Um, but basically, before this opera was written, a lot of the operas ended with, the father killing the favorite son. Like there was very little like love and family love and that, that wasn't in operas. You didn't see that very often until Verdi did this. And then it was like the mother loving her son so much and not wanting the son to die and, and all of this family love, the son protecting the mom and he gets killed because he's protecting his mom. That kind of thing was not part of opera before that. So that's where it's kind of a new thing in opera, but most of the kids aren't gonna get that, so you don't have to go into it. Um, and then you could show the, the that's, you bring in the, the blacksmith um, stuff um, and it, you'd have the kids dress up in the apron and they'd be hammering and that kind of thing. Um, and so, and you can ask the kids, what would happen if the bellows, so you'd have one person doing hammering, the blacksmith, one on the bellows. What would happen if somebody with the bellows was, was using it too much, blowing too much air? It would put out the fire. Um, 
And so you'll have the kids come in. You can even have a couple kids. I'm trying to decide um, in this blacksmith shop, kids coming by to watch. And they would have like a leather strap and their old fashioned books and their buckets, lunch pails and stuff walking by. I haven't decided if I want to go to that. Yeah, it's like these kids right here. Yeah. Do I want to like find the pails that they use and the leather strap and the old books? I haven't decided. That wagon is only so big. I don't know how much we can put in it. Um, but then, then when they got too hot from the flames, they would sit under the chestnut tree. Now, um, that ties into the Longfellow poem, whether you want to go in the poem. The poem just seems so far removed from everything else that I don't know how many people are going to go into the, all the stanzas of the poem, but you can use that if you want. And I have copies of the poem. There Look, the so first weird. four lines of the poem is exactly the scene. Under the spreading chestnuts. Yeah. Yes. So it does kind of show that. So you can actually have the kids, if they're acting out the, the blacksmith tableau, you can read part of that poem and say, this was a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Um, and so, um, let's see. So then you, when you play the music. The poem is not here, I think. Um, no, I, I have a copy of it, so, so you can have it. It'll you be just search for uh, the Village Backsmith Longfellow on Google and you find oh, it. Oh, I'm so prepared. <laughs> I, yeah, I had a free Saturday. The last Saturday was my day. We had Diwali and I was so busy until Friday. So I took the Saturday for myself. Oh my I God. sent the kids out with dad. <laughs> oh, now I think the battery on this has died. So I have to plug it in. Maybe yeah. a dumb question. How do you download the CD on your iPhone? Um, my husband did it for me. So I, so it, like you, I, I, I used it to iTunes. iTunes. I just put iTunes, it on sorry. iTunes and then pulled it down. Okay, right so. down. And it doesn't... It's not... Well, if you... So the annual chorus... You can have them. I think it's no, that is a fan for coming. It's playing. So you'll have the drums, you'll hear all the kettle drums in the background. And it's not until they get into the main part, so you'll have to Okay, this is it right here, and it's not it's here to Dun. So, I hope see if I can make it louder. You can actually hear the... Sorry, this is the battery side. The battery, I just charged on the other one, so it should work. Um, so, the, so you, they actually would hit it. So, if you do the maracas, you can have it do that. Otherwise, um, I have instruments. This is nothing... I have some instruments for them to use. If they want to do this, if you don't want to do the art activity, you can play that part for them. And then, let me just turn that down. You can have them, they'll actually yeah. hit this to it. I've got tambourines, you'll have, I have maracas, so you can have the kids get up. And so when you're sharing that part, you can have a few volunteers that'll actually try to get it to the beat. And so, and you can tell them, um, that in some of the orchestras, they actually had an anvil hanging that they would hit with a hammer. So that's kind of fun. Um, so that that some that is something that, depending on your class, if they're really into music, they might really like that. Um, and so then you can talk about the music elements. There's melody, harmony, rhythm, and uh, dynamics. And what is the prominent thing in this? It would be rhythm. It's that the pounding sound of the rhythm. It's the beat that that you'll hear. Um, let's see, and you can, so you can go into the percussion instruments, you can talk about those if you want that to be the focus. Um, I'll have pictures of all the different percussion instruments, so you can talk about that. Um, and then you can go into as much detail as you want about Verdi. So he's from Italy, and you can go into his background, um, there's so much information on his background. Um, it's very long. Longer than other stories uh, that I've read. Um, so it, it talks about like when he was 10 and then where he, he moved to Rosetto. And there's, so you'll, you can go and decide how much he was the organist at his church when he was 12. He, um, he became composing when he was 15. 